Some of you remember this film, Chariots of Fire. Back in 1981, it won four Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Original Screenplay. And it tells the story of Eric Little, an athlete in the 1920 Summer Olympics in Paris. And he refused to run in the heats for his favorite events, the 100-meter race, because the heats were held on a Sunday. Instead, he ran in the 400-meter race, which was held on a weekday, and he won that race. Now, Eric Liddell, he was the son of uh, missionaries who were missionaries to China. Early in this film, there's a scene where he accidentally misses a church prayer meeting because of his running. And his sister, Jenny, he reprimands him, accuses him of no longer caring about God. And Eric tells her that though he intends to return eventually to the China mission, he feels divinely inspired when running, and that not to run would be to dishonor God, saying, I believe that God has made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Remember that line on that movie? That's a great line in, in that movie. Probably one of the most quoted lines from that movie. So. Now, many people here grew up in a time when Bible-believing Christians would not participate in or even watch sports on a Sunday. I remember one of my professors in college he was talking about Sabbath restriction. He told us when he was growing up, he got in severe trouble once because he put his baseball glove on on Sunday. Not because he was playing baseball, he had just put his baseball glove on on Sunday. Now, we look at those restrictions and we consider them very legalistic. Yet, those who adopted those restrictions, they did so in a genuine effort to honor God. We may think they were elevating the letter of the law above the spirit of the law, yet they genuinely felt they were abiding by the truth that God had inspired in the Bible. Now, there's a sentiment that you sometimes hear. If we would just get back to the Bible, it would be a solution to all the problems we see around us in society. I fully believe in the authority, in the inspiration of Scripture. But you may have noticed that appealing to Scripture doesn't always yield agreement. You can probably compile a list of matters and issues in which Bible-believing Christians see things quite differently. Now, some issues are not as high-profile as they once were, but Christians have varied widely on issues, like can Christians drink alcohol? Can Christians go to movies? Can Christians use playing cards? Can Christians wear jewelry or makeup or go to dances? Should Christians use birth control? Churches have taken different... Uh, ideas or interpret things differently on the truth of the Bible and how that relates to things on church governance. Can someone who is divorced be a pastor? Or can they be an elder in a church? What's the role of women in a church? Uh, can they be ordained? Can they be an elder in a church? Can they be the lead pastor of a church? Should Christian organizations accept money from government that has been raised through lotteries? Could, should Christians buy lottery tickets? And there are particular Christian groups that have some very particular ways that they interpret, like the Amish, on the basis of their understanding of the truth of Scripture. They've resisted modern conveniences like electricity or gas-powered motors or taking photographs or using buttons because those could be, pri they, they could be immodest because they could be prideful to the, all that flashy display of buttons. So people have looked at things differently. If you read John Grisham, he's got some just interesting novels. One of his novels, called The Grey Mountain, he has a delicious description of a small town in the Appalachian Mountains. And he says this, There were churches everywhere, all believing in the inerrancy of Holy Scripture, but evidently agreeing on little else. <laughs> hmm, interesting. If getting back to the Bible is the answer for the problems in our society, why is it the churches that believe in the inerrancy and authority of Scripture have such a hard time getting along or agreeing? We're in this series, Walking with God, and there's a list there of the seven messages in this series. Today we're talking about walking in the truth. And at first glance, it would seem, well, walking in the truth seems fairly straightforward. I'm going to review some of the verses that talk about walking in the truth, but I'm also going to just explore a little bit about why it's not as easy as it always looks. It would seem that it would be easy. We walk in the truth. What's right? You just walk in that. But you don't have to look very far to see that there's, even among Bible-believing Christians, there's wide and varying views on what is true. 
in our larger world, we have this wonderful thing called the internet. And the blessing of the internet is that we have a mountain of information at our fingertips. And the curse of the internet is that we have a mountain of information at our fingertips. And it takes an incredible amount of discernment to understand how much of that information is actually right, is it good, is it true, and how much of it is just chaff and things that we should ignore. So if we just ignored the internet and just read our Bibles, everything would be fine, right? Well, we also need to understand the world that we live in. And the Bible isn't going to give you specific instructions on things. When an election comes up, it's not going to tell you who you're supposed to vote for in an election. It's not going to tell you how to make a mask (laughs) for COVID. And it's not going to weigh in on the efficacy of those masks. We see that Bible-believing Christians don't always agree on how to apply the commands and principles of Scripture to the current world that we live in. Is it that there is one little group somewhere, some evangelical group that has it all right and their ideas, they've, they've got it all sorted out? Does walking in the truth mean that we have to score 100% on all the complex issues of how to apply the truth of Scripture to the issues and decisions of 21st century living? Let's look at walking in the truth. Our key verse found in 3 John verses 2 through 4. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Isn't that a great phrase? Even as your soul is getting along well. It gives me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. A few other passages that use that same phrase, walking in the truth. In Psalm 86, verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Psalm 26, verse 3. Your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in the truth. Now, that's just a sampling, but I don't really have to go very far with this group to convince you that we should walk in the truth. Who wants to defend a lifestyle of walking in falsehood or walking in a lie or living in error? And while walking in the truth is a phrase we see maybe about a handful of times in Scripture, There are other passages that have the same idea emphasized in different ways. In the book of Proverbs, it emphasizes being on the right path or being on the path of wisdom. You have those classic psalms, Psalm 19 and Psalm 119, that talk about God's word and talk about the benefit of living according to God's word. So walking in the truth is certainly something that is within pages of scripture and something that we agree that we should do. But if it's something that we should do and it's so prevalent as an idea or theme within Scripture, why is there so much confusion about it? Certainly in the world there's confusion about what is true, but why is there even confusion in the church about what is true? The Apostle John writes in 1 John, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So how do we ensure that we're actually walking in the truth and not walking in darkness? The next message in this series is actually going to be walking in the light. And when I was putting this series together, I kind of wrestled with walking in the truth and walking in the light. Is that the same thing? And do I combine those into one message? But as I started to think about it, I thought, no, those are actually quite different. The reason I decided to put them in two different messages is that walking in the truth deals with our attitude, It deals with our perception of reality. What criteria do we use to decide what actually is true? How well does our perception of what is true align with life, with spiritual truth, with spiritual reality? How well does it align with the spiritual perspective of life that is revealed in the Bible? Walking in the light deals with how well we apply that understanding for our steps day by day. Where do we place our steps? So we'll look at that in a couple weeks after we have Thanksgiving next week. To walk in the truth, we have to take a close look at the filter that we use to interpret life and to interpret Scripture. We all have a filter. We all have, to us, 
a way that seems right. We have a filter that colors what we believe to be true. Now that filter is affected by many things. The first thing it's affected, and this has a huge effect all through our lives, is the family in which we grow up. Now we might, na- might not use the word true, but we have an automatic way that we respond, that we respond emotionally to the things of life. Is this right or wrong? Is it good or bad? And key areas of life, how do we deal with things such as money or work or play or politics or church or education or conflict or sexuality? We have a default understanding of right and wrong, good and bad, truth and error on the basis of the family which we grew up in. Now sometimes we align very closely with that and there might be times when we intentionally say, no, my family did things this way but I'm going to believe things in a completely different way on that. And then as we go through life, our filter begins to to change and get recalibrated a little bit depending on a lot of different things, our education, our experiences, our successes, our failures, our achievements, our disappointments. They all contribute on that filter that we use as we look at life and even as we look at Scripture to say what is actually true. Our understanding of good, bad, right, and wrong, true and false is shaped by all of those things and it shapes what we consider in our minds is a way that seems right. Unfortunately, the way that seems right or what I believe to be true or what you believe to be true is not always true or is not a complete picture of truth. And in the church... A common mistake that we make is to equate theology with truth. Theology, our articulation, our understanding of God and how we relate to God, is a partial picture. We explore truths about God by studying Scripture and as best we can to summarize and categorize and explain what Scripture says about God and about our relationship to God. And that's an incredibly important and valuable thing to do. But we can make a mistake. We can confuse truths with truth. We can equate our statement of theology, our understanding of theology, with truth. You see, we can take a portion of truth, our statement, the way we phrased it, whether that be in a creed or a doctrinal statement or a summary of the key message of the Bible or an articulation of a plan of salvation, and we consider it to be all that there is. We consider it to be truth, all of truth. Now, we can and we should study these concepts. We should understand them well. They're a foundational, they're a starting point, but we make some mistakes. We underestimate God's eternity And we also underestimate our own frailty. God is eternal. He is immortal. Now those concepts are incredibly hard to articulate and to understand. We're limited by human language. We're limited in our capacity to understand. And our attempts to do so and to articulate that in theology, they are helpful, but even the best of them are incomplete. The second mistake we make is to understand our own limitation, our own frailty. So even if theological statements fully explained everything that is true, every individual that's reading them or that is quoting them is limited. And every individual is contaminated by the pride of our own sinful nature. Since we claim to be standing on the truth, we don't easily recognize the degree to which our understanding is both incomplete and incorrect. And this has been a problem with God's people through the ages. The Jewish people who had incredible scholars, the scribes and the Pharisees, who studied scripture far more diligently than I ever have or any here ever have, they poured over those scriptures and they missed the signs when Jesus came. They didn't catch it. Their view of truth was incomplete. We look historically. Uh, the reformers, Martin Luther, incredible gift to the church and un- helping us understand salvation by grace. And he wrote so many helpful things. But if you look at all that Martin Luther wrote, there were some things that he wrote, particularly towards the end of his life, that were very racist and very anti-Semitic. 
Now we look at those now and say, hmm, that wasn't true. He didn't have all of truth. We know that through history there have been Christians that defended slavery on the basis of their take on truth. Looking back at history, we recognize their blind spots. We don't recognize our own blind spots. But those blind spots will be true to the future generations. When we mistake our limited perception of truth with truth itself, we have a huge blind spot. A blind spot that scripture calls the way that seems right. And there's a haunting little verse in Proverbs that says, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. Or another verse in Proverbs says, A person may think they, their, our, our own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. It's not just an Old Testament concept. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14? He said, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. The concept of truth is very closely aligned with the concept of a path or a way that we see all through Scripture. What way will we choose? What criteria will we use to decide if this particular path is helpful or harmful? And in the concept of a path or the way or truth, the path, that concept of a path actually helps us to understand this because... On a path, our perspective is limited. You can only see a short distance ahead of you. You don't know what's coming next. You you just have the path. You don't have an overall picture of where that path is leading, where it will take you. Truth, like a path, needs a map. It needs perspective beyond our own limited vision, beyond our own limited understanding, beyond what seems right to me at this present time. God has spoken to us, and he has spoken to us in Scripture in a way we can understand. And we also need help to interpret what he has said because our own view of the map is extremely clouded by our own filter of what seems right. I started this series, Walking with God, with Micah 6, verse 8. And yes, in that, what does God require to do justice? And many jump onto that and become all uh, uh, about action and uh, battling evil. And others jump on to do mercy and become all about compassion. But I suggested that there's three incredibly important words in Micah 6, verse 8. To walk humbly with. And that middle one, I put a red circle around to say humbly. The attitude with which we walk. That is so important. And that is critically important when it comes to walking in the truth. I think sometimes in the church and in the evangelical church, the call for getting back to a truth largely lacks that attitude. I assume that behind the picket lines and the signs and angry Facebook posts, there are Christians who have a compassionate nature, are caring people, but somehow what comes out is a lead that is, has a nasty edge of judgment and anger. Now, God has given us his word. We shouldn't be soft or wishy-washy or compromising. Yet, I see that sometimes in churches we have a tendency to encrust our own limited perception of truth and equate it with truth itself. We are to live in assurance. We are to live without compromise. But we need to live in a way that better reflects not only the truth, but Jesus who came full of grace and truth. So how do we do that? I want to look at the difference between two words, two ways of looking at things. One is certainty, and the other is confidence. I'm going to suggest that sometimes when we veer towards the certainty side, we may be veering off of truth, but we should be on the confidence side. See, certainty can be very, very rigid. There's only one way of looking at this. It's just this way. 
Whereas confidence is a little more resilient. It can look at different ideas that it can actually embrace a lot of more of the circumstances of life, of life and it's not shaken. Certainty is all about rules. Whereas confidence says, here's the principles that matter. Certainty is more about disagreement. If someone tells us something or if we hear something, we're in certainty, we're saying, no, no, that's wrong. There's this way of doing it, this way of looking at things, and this is the way that it is. Whereas confidence invites more dialogue. Certainty it becomes defensive. What goes on inside you when you hear someone from an idea that is, doesn't align with the way that you understand things? We want to correct people. No, you're wrong. But confidence is inquisitive. Tell me, how do you come to understand that? What's behind that? Tell me a little bit more about your idea, how you came to believe that. It's inquisitive. Certainty resists change, whereas confidence welcomes growth. Certainty polarizes. There's, as people get into their camps, and it's this camp against that camp, whereas confidence unifies. And a big one in this is certainty focuses on my knowledge, what I know, whereas confidence focuses on what God is teaching me. Subtle difference, but a huge difference. Certainty focuses on me, what I have come to under, what, what, what I know, my little package of truth that I've articulated in this way, here it is, whereas confidence rests on God and what he is teaching me. We are called to walk in the truth. How do we do that? In a complex world, how do we do that even in understanding Scripture? It's a big book and there's an awful lot in there. What do we emphasize? What do we, you know, how do we put that all together in a way that is going to make sense in 21st century life? We need to read, we need to study Scripture. But if we're not careful, we can fall into a habit of stagnation only highlighting those things that agree with what we already know. Leaning on our past understanding rather than growing into a fuller knowledge of the truth. So how do we walk in the truth? Well, here's a few steps. One, welcome questions. Replace certainty with a confidence that leaves room for questions. Don't stifle questions when people ask them. Manage that inward reaction of, oh, that's wrong. Respond with further questions to say, what's behind your thinking? What's behind that belief? You don't have to change your opinion to listen to someone else, to have dialogue with someone in a healthy and respectful and mutually beneficial way. Welcome questions. Ask more questions of people than try and correct them. Just ask questions. You'll probably discover a little bit more of what's happening. Listen to those who differ from you. Take time to listen to others, especially to those with whom you disagree. Listen well enough to understand why they perceive truth the way that they do. They understand truth differently than you. And as they look at life, there's probably some things in life that they understand better than you do. Because we all have areas that we understand and areas that we don't understand. Even if their conclusions are wrong, they have reasons for their conclusions that can be thoughtful, logical, even persuasive. And even if they're wrong in their conclusions, doesn't mean that they are all wrong. They are people created in God's image. And that image is still reflected in them in some degree. Clouded, yes, but it's going to be reflected in some degree. They arrived at their way of viewing things, what seems right to them, they arrived at that for, for reasons that are valid in, in their world, in their thinking. And when we say, just know that's wrong, that's wrong, we're, we're dismissive of them and we're not going to lead them to the truth in that way. Yes, we need to stand firm in what we know. We need to have that confidence. But we need to take that time to listen. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but the passage in John 4, the woman at the well, when Jesus was talking with her, 
what stood out with me in that passage is that, yes, Jesus knew that she had broken relationships. She had left a trail, she lived with a, heart, a trail of heartache and disappointment. Yet when he talked about that sensitive area of her life, he did so by affirming her perspective. He said, you are right in saying you have no husband. In fact, I think twice in that passage, he says, it's your right, it is true that. He started with a point of agreement, not a point of judgment, not a point of condemnation, not a point of correction. He started with saying, hmm, I can understand that perspective. I can see how you got there. So listen. Here's another big one. Zoom out. We all have such a narrow band of view of how we focus things. We see things with one lens and one lens only. But when you read through scripture, read through it with several lenses. One of those lenses is simply, how did the people that were first seeing these words, that were in that story, how did they understand this? What was going on in their heart and mind? What was their culture like? What was their lifestyle like? And how did that affect how they understood what God was saying, what scripture is saying? How about God's people through the ages? If you read commentaries, you can read commentaries of, you know, from centuries and centuries of church history, and that tells you a little bit more of how God's people have understood God's instruction to them through the, age, through the ages. And that is so helpful to expand because we zoom in and you know, we've got this, we've got our own background, we've got all our good teaching from the church, and that's all good, but we will automatically focus to one view of looking at a passage of Scripture. And sometimes we will miss some incredible things that God wants to teach us because we're just not zooming out far enough. And even beyond what has happened through the ages, how about what does this scripture passage say to different people in different times and different contexts? How do different people respond to this? People of different ages? A young person versus an older person? A single person versus a married person? Someone that's grown up in a rural setting versus someone that's grown up and lived all their life in a city? People of different educational backgrounds, people who live in a democracy versus people who live in a, an authoritarian or communist system of governments, people who have grown up in a church and have heard these stories all their life and people that are looking at this passage of scripture for the very first time. How about people who live as a minority group? Or how about people who have lived under religious persecution or have gone through the horrors of war? That scripture is going to speak so differently and apply so differently to people with all sorts of situations. So if we zoom out a little bit, we would be surprised at how we suddenly hear the voice of God in a new way. And our understanding of truth enlarges just a little bit. It's so hard to take off our own lenses and to see Scripture through the eyes of another. But if we do, we'll find that our, our, our truths are incomplete and limited. Truth encompasses far more than we understand. And a big one in the steps for walking in the truth is listen to the voice of Jesus. This is probably the most important one. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He also said, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We need not only the map of the words of Scripture, but we need a guide. And that guide is the Spirit of Jesus that dwells within us. Now, we're going to be looking at walking in the light, and we're going to be looking at walking in the Spirit and future messages in this. But we need someone to help us to say, no, that is the way. That is not the way to guide us. We need someone to help us to match what is happening in the world around us and to say, no, this is how truth actually applies. This is what aligns with reality. This is what doesn't align with reality. Our limited view of truth can get us in trouble. Just like sometimes the internet can get us down the wrong path. Uh, a sister-in-law of mine, she once booked a hotel room in Arizona online. And when they got there and they drove to the place where the hotel was, there was no hotel there. There was a construction project going on. The hotel was just being built. Online, it looked pretty good. They had pictures of all the lovely rooms and everything was online. It was perfect. And when they got there, there was no hotel there. Sometimes when we have a limited perspective of truth and we go through life, we are dealing with an incomplete picture. We need the truth of Scripture and 
the lens and the inspiration and illumination of the Spirit of Jesus to say, yes, this is true. This is the way. Walk in it. Jesus calls us to do that. He calls us to walk in humility. So we'll be free from living in that facade of truth that is our own limited understanding, our own way that seems right. It's a journey. It's not just a concept. It's not just an idea. Truth isn't just a doctrinal statement that we get all right, put a check mark and say, no, good, now I know truth. It is a journey. It is ongoing. Two illustrations about this. One is the book of Job. Book of Job is a fascinating book. You know the book that Job, he was a righteous man, and then some really tough things happened to him. He had uh, the, the worst run of things that anybody has ever had. And then some friends came to try and comfort him after calamity had struck. And when you read their speeches, there are many of the points that they make that seem to be pretty sound theology. Yet their picture of truth and their picture of God is incomplete. For instance, in Job 4.8, one of Job's friends says to him this. He says, I have observed those who plow evil, those who sow trouble, reap it. That's a scriptural truth. The law of the harvest. We see that in other places of scripture. You sow what you reap. That's, that's very much a principle of scripture. It is a truth, but it is not all of truth. Another in the book of Job. Another of Job's friends says, if you sin, how does that affect God? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? That is a good articulation of the self-sufficiency of God. God doesn't need us. He isn't dependent upon our worship. He isn't dependent upon our gifts or our offerings. That truth is echoed other places in Scripture. So Job's friend, he had some good theology. Yet, in the book of Job, when God shows up, And he starts talking to them. Listen to what he says. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourself. My servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken truth about me as my servant Job has. Interesting, isn't it? Eventually God shows up. And Job, with all his questions, with all his complaints, with all his uncertainty, is the one who is proven right. Could the book of Job be summarized this way? A questioning confidence reflects a better grasp of truth than orthodox certainty. Let me repeat that. A questioning confidence reflects a better grasp of truth than orthodox certainty. It's interesting in the book of Job. Job had questions. He had all sorts of things. He says, I don't get this, yet will I praise God. He continued to praise God. And even among all of those questions and say, what is going on? Truth is rooted in our eternal God. He has spoken to us through Scripture. We always add a filter of an interpretation that can cloud that. But God wants to speak to us. Another illustration that helps us with this is simply the very nature of walking. It says walking in the truth. Yes, I know in Ephesians it says stand with a belt of truth around your waist, so it does you standing as well. But the picture as a path uh, and walking is very prevalent in Scripture. And walking, when you look at from a physiological point of view, what the physiotherapists and they tell you is walking is actually controlled falling. When you walk, you're losing your balance and then regaining it, and losing it and regaining it again. That is actually what is happening. Now, an article I was reading on this, it talks about uh, how they had put someone on a treadmill and they hooked them up with all sorts of sensors and they watched exactly where their feet fell and their feet didn't fall exactly on the same spot every time. Sometimes it was a little to the left, sometimes it was a little to the life, to the right and that depended on, on where the pelvis was and what happens is the person gets a little out of balance, a little out of alignment and then pushes a little further back the other way. The foot goes out a little further in order to get them back onto where they should be. Walking in the truth. 
because we have a tendency to get a little bit out of balance on one side or a little bit out of balance on the other side, but God calls us to continue to walk in the truth. We value Scripture. Oh, and we should value Scripture. But Scripture in itself needs something else. It needs the presence of Jesus. In John 5, 39, Jesus said, You study the Scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the Scriptures that testify about me. We love the Scriptures and we should. Yet, our focus on the Scriptures is limited, is incomplete, if it doesn't lead us into a relationship with Jesus. Because the eternal life is not found in just knowing the truths of Scripture. Eternal life is not found in a doctrinal statement. It is found in knowing Jesus, who is the truth. And as we know him, that truth will shape us. It will change us. It isn't just an idea or a concept that we get right or wrong. It is a way, it is a path in which we walk. It's continually shaping who we are. In fact, in John 17, verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. First glance, you might look at that and say, Well, it says that your word is truth. Remember, though, this is the book of John that starts out by saying, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the (coughs) word was God. It's talking about Jesus Christ, who is the word. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. What does it mean by sanctify? Make them truly holy. Change them. Shape them. Consecrate them. Set them apart. Make their life different. Make their life, shape their life to what it should be and all that it can be. Truth is to accomplish something in our life. And that's perhaps why the Apostle John wrote, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. Oh, it gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Truth's not an idea or a concept or a weapon that we wield. Truth is a way in which we walk. Are we walking in it?